um, I think we've got Dr. Ellen Thomas with us. Ellen, we have had to rejig the schedule a bit. So if there's been a bit of confusion, if you're able to join now, we're doing your part of the talk about the genomic medicine service. So um, Ellen is the clinical director at Genomics England, and she's going to give us a bit of an overview of um, the genomics provision in, in the NHS across the UK. Um, are you still sharing your screen, Debbie? Oh, there we go. Um, so, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Ellen. No problem. Lovely to lovely to see you. So, um, can I just confirm that you can see my slides and see me and hear me? Yes. Lovely. Thank you. Yep. So, um, so I am um, an honorary consultant in clinical genetics at Guy's and St Thomas's, and I'm also the clinical director at Genomics England, um, which is a company that um, looks after the um, 100,000 genomes project samples uh, and also now offers um, whole genomes sequencing services to the NHS. So I'm really going to give you a bit of a dual perspective um, here today. I'm going to talk a bit about the, the sort of clinical um, aspects of, um, of genomic testing and also a bit about what we're doing at Genomics England, just as a, a very brief um, update. So this slide um, is one which I'm very grateful to um, the NHS England Genomics Unit for um, uh, letting me use, which just gives set, really sets out the, um, the overview of the Genomic Medicine Service. And I think you've heard um, a bit about that already from, from others this afternoon. But essentially, we've got, um, we've got um, the patient coming in being referred for genomic testing. Um, there's a, a, there are clinical genomic services who support that complex um, clinical care, and, um, and, but, but, but very much a lot of the testing now comes not from people who work within genetic services services. We've then got our network of genomic laboratory hubs and Debbie was talking about the, the four cardiac hubs a minute ago um, and we've also got Genomics England in the ecosystem um, uh, looking after the National Genomic Research Library and I'll talk a bit more about that um, in a minute. And then underpinning all of that, we have the National Genomic Test Directory that Debbie was also um, talking about, um, the WGS service, um, and the um, also supported by the, G the GMS alliances. So there's the Genomic Medicine Service alliances, which map to the genomic laboratory hub areas and perform a lot of sort of clinical leadership and clinical engagement um, uh, activities across those genomic laboratory hub areas. So in your own clinical areas, you may come across GLH or genomic laboratory hub staff who are based in labs and looking after the testing and the delivery of the um, genomic test directory. Um, you may also come across the GMS alliances who are delivering a range of initiatives which are really promoting um, adoption of uh, genomics um, across the system. And then NHS England is commissioning the service and is really very a very active commissioner in this area and is very engaged with um, getting this whole model um, set up uh, and functioning. And the aim really is to make sure that as a as a national network of labs, we are all working together in the ways that Debbie described to make sure that we are delivering um, um, genomic care to patients in a way which is joined up, um, standardised, advanced, um, scientifically led, clinically led, and that ensures that the patients um, get equity of access um, according to uh, according to their need. So. There we are. So um, you've already seen this list um, from Debbie. So this is some of the, the conditions in the cardiology directory. I've put the link in there um, and um, I'm hoping that you'll be sent these slides so you can down the, the National Genomic Test Directories are available on the website. The key one really for the, for these purposes is the PDF of the rare disease directory, which is um, a, a document that you can then um, download and look at this list and then click through to the to the details of all the tests that, that you can request. So each um, clinical indication um, within the directory, which um, which are in that list, tells you which patients are eligible. And I've shown you a different example from the, the example that Debbie showed you here. And really, from a clinical point of view, um, the there there is a set of testing criteria which. I've shown you the ones for CPVT here, but um, it's there are there's a list of things which are sometimes measurements or sometimes to do with family history, and those are really trying to to sort of drill down into which patients are going to benefit from having these tests. So that's a really important thing to stick to. You know, if you go, if you're if you're regularly testing outside that target, if the system is working as it should, then you're probably not going to get very much of a yield. If you think you are getting a yield outside that target, then that's something to put in, as Debbie said, to see if you could change it. But in general, the system is set up trying to make sure that the testing capacity across the country is targeted at the patients who can benefit. 
Now, it is worth noting that if you took all of the patients who met those criteria and tested them all straight away, the, the capacity with the system probably would struggle because there are a lot of patients, particularly in inherited cardiac clinics, who do meet these criteria. So there is in, in this green box here, there is a bit of a kind of extra bit in most of the um, in most of the, the, the indications in the test directory. So the first bit you can see there is that it says that testing should be carried out in parallel with expert phenotypic assessment. Um, so, for example, in an ICC, um, which includes support from clinical genetics and that sometimes you will have edge cases, edge case situations where if the ICC, MDT and clinical geneticists have all got together and said, yeah, but, you know, there's something a bit unusual here. So we don't quite meet these criteria, but there is there's an unusual family history or there's an unusual feature on the um, on the echo or whatever it is. We really should test in this situation. Then it is sometimes appropriate to test outside these criteria. But equally, the last clause here is that um, testing should be targeted at those where a genetic or genomic diagnosis will guide management for the proband or family. So this is not intended to be for every single patient. So if you've got somebody who is um, in their 50s and they have no children and no siblings and they have a firm clinical diagnosis and they meet these criteria, then are you going to benefit from doing a genetic test? What's it going to add? It's not going to add to their management. Um, it, unless you have a specific um, condition in mind where it would add to their management, which would obviously change things. But if it's if uh, in a lot of inherited cardiac conditions, the reason for doing the testing is as much for the family as it is. And, you know, Debbie showed that fantastic example of a, a test which had those enormous Im Im implications for a wider family. If somebody doesn't have that wider family. You may not need to do the test. So it's really just a question of each one of us across the system really taking responsibility for making sure that we are using this very precious resource of this very expert um, set of people doing these very technically complex tests, that we're focusing that for patients where they can really benefit. So it's it's getting the balance right between the directory provides a set of rules, it is a directory, it tells you what to do, but equally we have clinical judgment and we need to apply that clinical judgment and use that um, use the service um, as um, um, as effectively as possible for our whole patient body. So um, so the clinical indication tells you which patients are eligible for the test. It tells you what type of test will be offered. And then um, if you want to know which genes will be analysed for your test, you then go to panel app. Um, so you can see there I've shown what happens when you go into the, uh, the panel apps website. Um, and on, on the next slide, I'm just going to show you a bit more about the panel app website. So when you go in there at the top there, you've got the three um, the three um, uh, rows, GMS panels, um, panels, genes and entities. So if you go into the GMS panels, you can search there and I've just typed in cardiac and you can see I've come up with a number of different gene panels there. Um, and then it tells you a few things about those cardiac panels. So you can see, for example, the cardiac arrhythmias panel. Um, it's tagged with GMS rare disease virtual. And what that means is that if you wanted, if you were doing a genome sequence for somebody who had a, um, like if you had a, a child with intellectual disability and a neurological problem and a cardiac arrhythmia, you could apply this panel on the rare, where it says, because it's a virtual panel, you could apply that for the, um, for on the on the rare disease um, genome, on the genome sequence for that patient with the broader phenotype. If it doesn't say rare disease virtual, then you can't um, apply it for genome sequencing. Um, and it also tells you when it was signed off. So that's really important because the um, panels in this website are all ones which have been cleared by the NHS governance process as being appropriate for diagnostic use. So it tells you about the fact that it's been signed off um, as a, an NHS panel. If you then want to know, well, I think this patient's got this gene condition and I want to look up which panel it's on, you go into the genes and entities um, um, uh, um, tab and then you type the name of your gene in and click on it and this is where you get to. So this is an example of MYH11 and you can see here that there are two different conditions caused by this gene. Down the right you can see that there are there are the different phenotypes. I think most of us are more familiar with it as a as a thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissection gene but um, it also has a has a, another phenotype um, MMIH and the first phenotype is caused by biallelic so two 40 copies of the gene and the FTAD is caused by a single 40 copy of the gene so that's monoallelic. So that's immediately just gives you a sense of what conditions and you can see you could get those via the R21 indication and the R125 indication depending on which one it was that you were interested in. So it gives you a bit more um, sense of what you need to request in order to cover a specific target for your patient of interest. 
So just broadening out now to think to just to give you a few little updates about things that um, Genomics England is um, is up to. So uh, many of you will be familiar with the 100,000 Genomes project where um, we ended up with um, more than 100,000 genomes from 100,000 odd people um, in rare disease and cancer. About probably about two thirds to three quarters of the patients were uh, rare disease patients and their relatives. Um, and um, when patients joined the project, they were given the option to find out additional um, health related information. So this is a specific list of conditions, which you can see on the left there, which are things where we can look in the genomic data and say, OK, well, you joined the project because you had a child with epilepsy, for example. But would you want to know if you had a BRCA mutation? And if people said yes, they did want to know these things, then they are currently being processed through um, an additional findings pipeline. Line. We've been doing it for about a year now and it's due to be complete by the end of this year. Um, we've so far processed the additional findings for nearly 70,000 people. We've still got about 7,000 to go and about 1.7% of them have had a finding highlighted to the NHS um, for further interpretation. Not all of those will end up having something which, where we're confident enough to, um, to initiate um, clinical, clinical care on the basis of it. And the really key thing about this is that we're doing an evaluation study um, to understand the clinical impact and the patient experience of these looked for findings. And what I think will probably strike this audience is that um, that the cardiac conditions and arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies are not on that list. And really the reason for that is just the level of understanding we currently have, um, as Debbie was um, was talking about earlier, about what is the impact of a variant on somebody when they don't have a phenotype? Could that, you know, is that going to cause a phenotype? What are the chances of that causing a phenotype? How how predictive are these in, in, in that context? So, um, so until there's a bit more data on that, it's it's been felt so far that it wasn't appropriate to look for um, look for these cardiac conditions via this mechanism. But um, it's you know there, there are lots of questions still to be asked about that, and there, there'll be more data coming out of the US where there is a lot more return of um, additional findings going on much more routinely, and potentially more data coming out of further research in the UK, which will feed into whether we should be doing this in the longer term. So Genomics England also looks after the National Genomic Research Library. This contains all of the genome and clinical data from the 100,000 Genomes Project with all the um, identifiers for the patients removed, with their name and date of birth and so on removed from that um, in a trusted research environment. Um, and um, Genomics England is now operating on this, this what we call infinity loop model, where we've got, um, we've got our healthcare service on the left hand side, where we're getting more patients in from the um, NHS to have genome sequencing um, with a, a um, a, a diagnostic version of the sort of um, the sort of process that they went through in the 100k project. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have lots of researchers in the National Genomic Research Library answering questions. Um, and then we pass data backwards and forwards between those contexts without identifying the patients to researchers. So patients are asked whether they want to join the NGRL and um, the um, and um, and clinicians are given information back about their patients if they do if they do join the NGRL if they're having a genome sequencing test and we also link up um, researchers and clinicians um, via a, a mechanism which doesn't identify the patient but we've had a lot of circumstances where clinicians and researchers have got together um, and further investigated unusual findings novel findings complex findings um, um, to try and make diagnoses and advance understanding and bring together groups of patients for the publication so there's still a lot of um, research and research clinic, clinical research, research interface work going on um, in the NGRL and the, um, the genomic medicine service patients are now joining in on that. Um, out of the 36,000 odd patients um, uh, probands, so families recruited to the 100,000 Genomes Project with rare diseases, um, we um, the cardiovascular disorders are the light blue in that um, pie chart. So you can see they are the second common, the second most common um, uh, reason for being in the NGRL is that you do have a cardiovascular disorder. So there is a huge amount of data in there um, and many researchers working on it. Um, and if you're interested in that, please do get in touch because there are ways that you too can access that data. Um, in the um, in the uh, clinical context now, we have a system where patients who are having a diagnostic genome sequence are asked, um, they're, they're asked to sign a consent form and there are two sides to the consent form. One side is about the diagnostic test and one side is about the research 
offer. So the first, pa first piece of paper tells them a set of standardised things produced by the NHS to um, explain what is it that every patient needs to know if they're having genomic testing. So this is actually, you can download this um, from, you know, from various websites um, and it's quite a nice little kind of very brief. These are, you know, think what I need to know about the testing, uncertainty, um, unexpected information, what's going to be stored in the way of DNA data, health records um, and research. The other side of the form is about the National Genomic Research Library and it tells you about what happens about security and recontact and how we'll use data and samples and store that and about withdrawal. So again, it's a kind of there's lots of more information to back this up, both on, you know, there's a leaflet and there's a website and so on. So patients can go and look up more information about this, but they can. But this is the kind of key thing that you need to know in order to decide whether you want to make your data available um, in this context. So finally, I was just going to focus in on one of the processes that we um, that we follow in the at our clinical research interface, um, and um, this is a process whereby when researchers are working on um, the data, they sometimes encounter new genetic diagnoses which weren't made in the original analysis. This can be for all sorts of reasons to do with advancing knowledge or advancing technologies or specific um, unusual situations where an, an individual expert can pull things out of the data which maybe wouldn't be so obvious to an automated pipeline or a more general um, a more general analyst um, and so we have a, an oversight group that oversees this pathway um, and uh, genetic diagnoses are made by made by researchers checked by gel to check that they're not incidental findings or whatever and then returned to the nhs for return to patients and you can see here through the course of this year the numbers um, of uh, variants that have been that have come through the system and been returned and all of the green ones um, the, the orange ones are still in progress um, and the green ones have all been returned to the NHS so you can see actually the researchers you know, there, there are not many variants it's only a small proportion where a researcher thinks it might be relevant um, and most of the ones where a lot of the ones where it's not are um, ones where either the evidence isn't quite there yet for it being diagnostic or because um, the because the GLH already knew about it um, and the, the researcher hadn't realized that it had already been returned. So um, this is a this is a great legacy of the um, of the project, I think, and a, a great example of how the research world and the um, clinical world are really working together in genomics to try and make sure that um, the patients get um, get diagnoses um, as, as, as much as possible. So if you do get contacted about any of your 100k patients, um, it's not you know, it, it, it probably is something quite important and quite real. So please do please do respond to that and um, and work out work out what it is. So that was everything I was going to update you on today, just a slightly different different um, perspective on the genomic medicine service but um, Ellie I don't know if we're doing questions now or if you're wanting to to wait for a bit. So um, I think we're going to do a panel discussion at the end if you're able to join that or hang around for a bit that would be great Ellen and we can do some questions then. Um, we've had a bit of a change to the scheduling due to sort of unforeseen circumstances with the scheduling we aren't able to have um, Professor Mariana Fontana today talking about amyloidosis. So that's why things have been moved, moved around a little bit. But we will have a bit more time um, for case discussions and uh, questions at the end. So yeah, if you're able to stick around, that would be great, Ellen. And thank you so much for that really comprehensive overview. It's so exciting to hear what we have planned for the future, both in terms of clinical testing and research as well. As you say, they need to go hand in hand um, in the future. Um, so 